Now joined here in our Doha studio by veteran Palestinian activist and politician and former member of the Palestine Liberation Organization Executive Committee, Hanan Ashrawi. Dr. Ashrawi, really great to have you with us here Thank in Doha. You. Thank you. It's good to be with you, Anastasia. Given what we're seeing now already on the ground in Rafa, let me start by asking you what your greatest fears are in the coming days and weeks. Well, it's not that I'm worried about a, a disaster, a human catastrophe and so on, because it's happening. Yeah. It's already happened. We are in the midst of a genocide, and Israel is hell-bent on taking it a notch up uh, in the sense that it wants, having treated the, uh, the Palestinians with total dehumanization like herds of cattle, where they shift them from one place to the other, carrying out demographic engineering, thinning out the population, as Netanyahu says. They forced them into the south. They, they shelled them and bombed them and sniped them on the way. And now they're saying, no, now you have to move somewhere else because we're going to destroy the last refuge that you had. So everybody, of course, is worried. And everybody knows that there are no limits to uh, Israeli depravity, to Israeli uh, bloodthirst, to the use of, of massacres and carnage and so on to achieve. We don't know what ends because they don't know what ends. They cannot destroy Hamas and they cannot uh, uh, achieve absolute victory, as he says. So in a sense, there is a, a willful infliction of pain, death and destruction without any accountability. and. Uh, buying time and, and uh, uh, using all sorts of procrastinations and uh, diversionary tactics to say they are engaged in talks and their primary objective is to release the hostages, where their primary objective is to destroy uh, not just the Palestinians of Gaza, but all of Palestine. You talked about moving people yes. from place to place yeah. and now wanting to move them somewhere else. Well, Egypt mm -hmm. has said that a red line for them would be the forced mass displacement of Palestinian refugees over that border. Yeah. How likely is that, regardless? Yes. It is likely because they have been carrying out forced displacement. They've been carrying out, and the uh, um, uh, International Court of Justice indicated that there are certainly uh, genocidal uh, acts being committed. But at the same time, this is rather disingenuous because you have totally closed them in uh, with nowhere to go. Now they are in Rafah, which was told, they were told was a safe area. Yeah, yeah 1.4 million. Tightly, if you throw a stone, you will hit 10 people there. So they're tightly closed in with nowhere to go, and they are shelling them. And they're using sniper fire to kill them. And you've seen footage of children, of women yeah. with their own babies being shot in cold blood, being sniped. So they snipe, they kill, they shot a doctor in the middle of an operation. They're doing these things to a helpless captive population, saying they are looking for captives or they are looking for Hamas leaders. So what is disingenuous is that they have nowhere to go and they are going to be uh, shot at and so on. And then they say uh, they cannot be herded out or, or uh, Egypt doesn't want them to go to Egypt. We don't want them to leave. They don't want to leave. Yeah. But in order for them to stay, stop the carnage, nobody addresses the real issue, yeah. which is Israel's genocidal policies, Israel's massacres, Israel's carnage, Israel's impunity, and of course, the, the blatant support by the US and the West in order to give it more room, more space, more blessings to continue with this wanton, vicious destruction. Well, so don't tell me you don't go anywhere. <laughs> Stop killing them first. Stop the massacres. Well, let me ask you then about the possibility of a ceasefire. We just heard Charles there talk about how Israel is going to Cairo with no idea yeah. of a potential ceasefire on the table. But obviously that's what Hamas has been offering yeah. for, and, and calling for. Yeah. This is a deal primarily at the, at the beginning of it to release captives. Mm -hmm. Given that that might result in at least pauses in the fighting, how likely is that, that that change in momentum to lead to a lasting ceasefire if a deal is indeed made? I doubt, first of all, I doubt whether a deal will be made. Hmm. First of all, the Americans don't want one. They gave Israel time and space to do it, right? They hmm. said, provided you take, you know, you can do this, but you take measures to protect innocent lives. Well, have they protected? Have they taken measures? Have they listened? No. So. In a sense, they gave them a green light to continue, number one. Number two, the focus is always on releasing the hostages or the captives or whatever, without totally de decontextualized, without looking at the real issues. 
The real issues is that there is a genocide taking place. We as Palestinians have over 10,000, 11,000 captives in Israel. We have three, 4,000 uh, administrative detainees without trial, without charges, and so on. And every day they keep arresting them. Israel wants to focus, and the U.S., only on releasing captives. What about a whole Palestinian population held captive? What about thousands and thousands of Palestinians detained and held captive in Israeli jails? Well, then, how, how do you change the narrative? We've spoken a lot about the United States right now. Yeah. And I've been wondering, as we've seen the Palestinian Authority, President Mahmoud Abbas, he, he's been in, in Doha in yeah. recent days as well. There's been a lot of speculation uh, around a potential brokered reconciliation between Hamas and Fatah. Mm -hmm. Do you think that that some kind of unified Palestinian front, would that give Palestinians more agency here and an ability to change a narrative? Absolutely. It's not just to change a narrative, but it should enable the Palestinians, empower the Palestinians to take a unified stance. Now, one of the strategies of Israel and the U.S. is to isolate Hamas, totally demonize Hamas, as you know, and to label everybody as a terrorist, Hamas and all the Palestinians, and therefore give themselves a free hand to carry out this carnage and death and destruction. But the moment we repair internally our own political system, the moment we have a democratic, inclusive, uh, healthy political system, the more empowered we are, not just to withstand <coughs> Israeli uh, onslaughts and, and efforts, but also in order to repair our decision-making process in order to gain legitimacy and support also by the public. You speak there about a democratic and inclusive functioning government. Of Absolutely, sorts. yes. When you yourself resigned from yeah. the PLO in, in 2020, I believe it was, yes. you were very critical of how it was being run at the time. Right. What's your assessment of the state of the PLO now? Unfortunately, the trajectory has continued, which is the, the weakening of the PLO entirely, taking over decision-making by not even the PA, but the presidency and a, a few people around him. And the PLO has been sidelined, undermined, and, and uh, in a sense, it weakened mm. the uh, body politic. It weakened the representational body of all Palestinians everywhere, not just in the West Bank, Jerusalem, and Gaza, but also in, uh, throughout the world. Because this is, uh, as uh, Yasser Arafat used to say, this is the national home of all the Palestinians. This is the inclusive representative body, and it is in bad need of repair and reform and revitalization. Not all Americans, but yeah. the way the Palestinians... When I resigned, I said very openly, first of all, we have to make room for the young people, for women. We have to uh, uh, have a genuinely democratic representative body, and at the same time, the total uh, immobilization and disregard and sidelining of the PLO has to stop, because the, the PA is representative only of part of the people on part of the land yeah. and is a, an outcome of a signed agreement which is essentially flawed. And the PLO is a national body and it needs serious repair and, and uh, reform and restructuring. And there has been a lot of discussion about what that reform might look like. Before I yeah. let you go, Dr. Ashrawi, yeah. I do want to ask you about one specific thing. You were very, very critical of Abu Dhabi when they normalized ties yes. with Israel. Yes. There's been a lot of talk about normalization of ties with Saudi Arabia. Yeah. The U.S. seems to be wanting to use that as some kind of a carrot here to try to, to end the conflict. Would you be against that now yes. if, if it actually brought an end to the offensive in Gaza? It won't bring an end to an offensive. Because when the U.S., it was during the days of Trump, brought several Arab countries, not just the, the Emirates and others, to normalize with Israel, they told us this is an, only in order to stop the annexation. But they were increasing the annexation, and they continued. Don't do us favors like that, please. So they normalized the occupation. They undermined the Arab Peace Initiative. They created fragmentations within the Arab body, body politics, both vertical and horizontal, the people and their leadership. <clears throat> the Arab people don't like normalization. And but let me say this. The Americans, the Americans, this is a linchpin of their policy in mm. the region. Huh? Normalization. Why? They want to integrate, as they say, Israel in the region. They want to reposition it as a major political, economic, military, security, intelligence power. Hmm? 
in order to run the show. It is not just the Palestinians. Of course, they're sidelining the Palestinians, and they're giving Israel a free hand to destroy it, the way you're seeing it. But they are rewarding Israel, because American mm -hmm. policy from Trump and on is just to be able to reposition Israel in such a prominent place in the region to redefine enemies and friends. Only Iran is your enemy, Israel is your ally, and so on. And to weaken the Palestinian cause and the whole uh, Arab system and structure in the region. This is extremely dangerous. Dr. Hanan Ashrawi, veteran politician and Palestinian activist, thank you so much for joining us here. In thank Ohio you, Anastasia. It's so good to be with you.